Good morning. Today we're looking at church death once more. And this is a church death that results from compromise. How do you view compromising? What feelings come to your mind when you hear that word? For myself, I often think of sleazy politicians, closed door deals, cravings for power or popularity. Yet, after a lifetime of working with people of all ages. It reminds me that there is a healthy side to compromise. Two parties meeting each other halfway or working a compromise out, a consensus among different competing interests, two daughters two kids. So what does it really mean to compromise? Is it to agree? Is it to appease? Is it to cooperate? Or is it to concede? To find common ground? Or to give up ground? To bargain? To barter? To bury the hatchet? Conflict resolution is encouraged in our society. It's a way we talk, teach children how to resolve conflicts. It's what we talk to people in business about dealing with. C.S. Lewis has written countless essays there are books of his essays that were recovered and put in book form after his death. In one of C.S. Lewis's most memorable essays, it's entitled The Inner Ring. It describes the experience or the desire of people to want to be on the inside of a group that matters. It's to feel excluded or to be out of it is a horrible feeling. But it's the desire to be in, to be accepted, that is the point of this particular essay. And he says, I believe that in all men's lives, at certain periods, and in many men's lives, at all periods, he uses men's, but he means all people's, between infancy and extreme old age, one of the most dominant elements is the desire to be inside the local ring the terror of being left outside. In school, you want to be part of school government, you want to be part of the sports team, you want to be part of the drama club, the band, whatever group that you're a part of. In college, it's a certain departments, and fraternities, sororities, clubs on campus, those kinds of things. In work, you want to be significant. You want to be a partner. You want to be a team member. You want to be a director. You want to get a promotion to be part of the executive team. 
in church, you want to be on the board. You want to be on a committee, a deacon, an elder, a volunteer. You want to have some part in it all. Lewis says it may eventually end in a crash, a scandal, and penal servitude. It may end up in millions, a peerage, and giving prizes at your old school. But you will become a scoundrel. The first small compromise may lead somewhat innocently down a path to real corruption. For instance, I once got to know a pharmacist who ended up in federal prison. He told me that he had once sold a drug without a prescription to someone who asked him for it. Over time, that first sale led to numerous sales and a pattern of drug dealing. He told me that when he first sold a drug illegally, he never imagined that he would end up in prison. The first act led to a habit that profoundly impacted his destiny. Lewis goes on to say, and you will be drawn in. And if you are drawn in by the desire for gain or ease, but simply because at that moment, when the cup was so near your lips, you cannot bear to be thrust back again into the cold outer world. It would be so terrible to see that other man's face, that genial, confidential, delightful, sophisticated face turn suddenly cold and contemptuous to know that you had been tried for the inner ring and been rejected. As long as you are governed, he goes on to say, by that desire to be in the inner circle, you will never get what you want. You are trying to peel an onion. If you succeed, there will be nothing left until you conquer the fear of being an outsider. An outsider you will remain. Compromise has great advantages, but it doesn't solve things. There were 13 colonies being attacked by the mother country, Britain. They banded together. They had different values for humanity. One believed in freedom and another group believed in slavery. And it was ripping the country apart within the first 25 years. And they came up with a Missouri Compromise The 16th Congress passed the legislation on March 3rd, 1820, and President James Monroe signed it on March 6th, 1820. This was an idea to bring these two groups together. See, the problem was that as the country grew beyond the 13th, how would they go? Would they be free or would they be slaves? So there's this compromise. Missouri was going to be a slave state. Maine was going to be a free state. And it was based on a parallel, 36 degrees, 30 north. It worked for a while about 25 years. Then they had to have another compromise. The 
Compromise of 1850. This is when President Millard Fillmore. This is a result of the um, the uh, territory of the um, Mexican American War, the Alamo, and thereafter. But see, compromise happens in the business world. This last year, we had the World Cup, and it was in Qatar. Qatar is a Muslim country. You cannot drink in a Muslim country. So Budweiser negotiated with the the powers that be in Qatar to have a product there. Budweiser Zero. They compromised. They were there. But see, this company's been compromising. And you know what has happened in the last three or four months. There are huge layoffs in Budweiser because of compromising. We're encouraged to compromise in relationships, but you can't compromise on things that you can't compromise about. The problem with compromise, you get what you never wanted. You never would have dreamed to end up there. It didn't help. The Missouri Compromise did not help. The Compromise of 1850 did not help. Compromise is usually the fallback position in a negotiation, and it will often lead to at least one party disappointed in the outcome. And that takes us to Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. See, Jesus commends the church at Pergamum for persevering, for their faithfulness in spite of people dying. But he warns them about compromise with an adulterous and immoral culture. Jesus loves their faithfulness, their witness, even to the point of more martyrdom. But he opposes these teachings that were coming up in the Church of Pergamon that would encourage them to compromise with the pagan culture. And Jesus judges by the sheer power of his word. And those who overcome are promised eternal fellowship with the Lord and his people. To the angel of the church in Pergamon write, these are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin. 
so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. We left Smyrna, and figuratively, if, if you can imagine, if you left Smyrna and you were carrying this letter to the church of Smyrna, you would travel along the coast of the Aegean Sea for about 40 miles. And then 10 miles inland stood the impressive city of Pergamum. It was built on a hill, a thousand feet above the surrounding countryside, creating kind of a natural fortress. And on the top of this fortress was a mountain and it was filled with temples. Pergamon was a sophisticated city, the center of Greek culture and education. It boasted of one of the great libraries in the world. 200,000 volumes were in this library. It was only second to the famous library in Alexandria, Egypt. There is a legend that says that uh, Pergamon tried to get a librarian from Alexandria to go to Pergamon. And the king of Alexandria at the time got wind of it, the king of Egypt. And he st stopped exporting papyrus to Pergamon. And this embargo resulted in Pergamon's development as what has become known as parchment, a writing material made from animal skins. That legend probably is not true, but the reason Pergamum went to animal skins is because of the climate. You hear that word a lot, but I'm not using it the way you think I'm going to. See, the air in Greece was not dry like in Egypt. We have papyri from 5,000 years ago that have been buried in Egypt. But in a wet climate, it doesn't last long at all. But parchment, sheepskin, goatskin, are materials that have lasted for centuries. Pergamum was the center of four of the most important gods of the day. Zeus, Athena, Dionysus, and Eclipetus. Eclipetus. And the chief god was Ecliptus, whose symbol was the serpent, and who was considered the god of healing. And people came from all over the world to seek healing from this god. This the symbol of Ecliptus you will see it at pharmacies to this day. It is a winged pole and wrapped by two snakes. 
See, those who worshipped Ecleptus would go to the temple and they would lie down on the floor. And in this temple, non-poisonous snakes roamed freely in this temple. They would lie there on the floor hoping to be touched by one of these snakes, symbolically representing the God himself, therefore being healed. And this symbolism was not looked kindly upon by Christians. The serpent, Satan, was not incorporated in their thinking. The Emperor Diocletian had some stone cutters executed for refusing to carve the image of Ecliptus. It was also the first city in the Roman Empire granted permission to build a temple to the living emperor, Augustus, before he died. In 29 BC. See, this imperial court, cult was very entrenched in Pergamon. It had been here for centuries. And people in this period, because of the emperor, were dying because they would not worship both Christ and the emperor. See, that's a kind of thinking that you can compromise. You know, I can worship Caesar and I can worship Christ at the same time. See, the, the same problem is in Hinduism in India. If Christianity could just be one of the many gods that Hinduism has swallowed up over the years, it would have been fine. There are so many gods in Hinduism. And anytime there's a new religion, they try to just engulf it, include it with the rest of them. But Christ is not like that. There is no compromise. He stands alone. He is distinct and above all of the false gods. There is no room for compromise in any of the Ten Commandments. There is no other God before him. The Roman army was very effective in battle. And it was because of the gladius sword that they became effective. They used to have a broad sword and a shield, and the thing was heavy, and you would wield it, and you'd have to hold the shield and protect yourself and make a strike. But the gladius was a short sheet, uh, sword. Less than a couple feet. And it was double-edged. So no matter which way you slung it, that edge would cut and defeat the enemy. In the Roman world, we see this with Pontius Pilate. 
he was the governor of the region of Rome, but he couldn't cause the death of someone. He had to go to Rome to get that. He couldn't perform executions. But the proconsul of Pergamon had been granted this rare power known as the right of the sword, meaning that he could perform executions. Verse 12, it says, These are the words of him who has the sharp, sharp double-edged sword. See, Christ is like this gladius sword. He speaks the word of God, and the word of God cuts no matter which way it is read. It's double-edged. It's sharp. And Christ has the ultimate power over life and death. I know where you live, Jesus says to this church, where Satan has his throne. It could be all of the, any one of these pagan temples, or it could be the combination of all of them, but most primarily this imperial cult, because it was the Roman imperial cult that was causing the, the death of believers who refused to worship the emperor. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city. See, we know nothing about Antipas from first-hand sources at the time. But Tradition, verbal tradition, has it that Antipas was tied to a metal bull and roasted to death on this hot bull that was heated by fire. And he and his name means against all paganism, Antipas, against all paganism. Some among you hold to the teachings of Balaam, likewise to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. See, these groups encouraged worship with those who were pagan or were worshiping the emperor. The story goes back to Balak and Balaam, recorded in Numbers 22 through 25. A short version of the story is this. Balak was a king who feared the large number of Israelites traveling through his country. So he hired Balaam a sorcerer, and told him to pronounce a curse on them. Balaam had refused at first, but the offer of money changed his mind. And Numbers 25, 1 through 3, describes the Israelite men getting involved with pagan women and worshiping the gods of Moab. See, he corrupted them. And that was what is, was happening here in the church of Pergamum. And Jesus' words to this church in regards to this are, Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I also will give that person a white stone with a new name written on it known only to the one who receives it. Along with his warning, Christ included a threefold promise that they would receive divine food, hidden manna, special favor, a white stone, 
and a new character or a new name. The hidden manna could be Christ himself, the spiritual nourishment of believers, both now and for eternity. Christ likened himself to the bread of heaven, the manna that came down from heaven and nourished the church, the children of Israel during their wanderings in the wilderness. A white stone inscribed with a new name is less certain, but it, some, it sometimes would symbolize special access to God. White stones were used as a ticket for admission into a theater in Pergamum. And white and black stones also indicated a degree of guilt or innocence. So a white stone would be you were innocent before God. It's, it's a ticket, not only re representing his innocence, but he's able to go to the messianic banquet. In our world, we don't struggle with eating food offered to idols, but we struggle with other culturally accepted practices that are clearly just as idolatrous as joining a guild or, or emperor worship. It is a fine line between encouraging interaction with our culture in order to serve it, in order to love, in order to witness, and compromising with the culture. They were compromising their faith with idol worship and sexual immorality. They were mixing things that cannot be compromised. See, Christians today are oftentimes deeply interested in material advancement. Some people are workaholics. They spend countless hours working yet very little time on God's word. We know that from studies that most Christians today never share their faith with non-Christians. No explaining to them how they think and how they operate, what makes them tick. Are we praying for the Lord's return? If we are, we should be spreading the good news because it's a prerequisite of his return. And evangelism takes time and closeness. You have to understand what makes another person tick and what they struggle with. There's, today we have not only sexual immorality, but we have chemical addictions. Some young people are vaping in school. You can't tell that they're high, but they are. They're taking Valium, other medications. They're not all there. A lot of adults are on anti-anxiety medication.
we can't compromise with things that God cannot compromise on. Jesus had compassion on people who were caught in sin. He ministered to prostitutes, tax collectors, and sinners. But we need to be careful that we don't compromise the church. Oftentimes we lower our standards trying to get more people to come to church. And then they don't, we don't want to offend them by what we say in church. So we really don't preach to them the complete gospel. It's important to present the church as a body of people who were committed to one God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. See, our culture demands equal rights for alternative lifestyles. It rejects traditional values. It winks at sin. It glorifies rebellion. See, Christ isn't into compromise. See, compromise doesn't happen quickly. It's like a ship. It's on course, and it's, you don't usually turn, make a right turn, hand turn, but it's a, it's a gradual drifting off course. There are invisible waves, there are invisible currents. The wind gradually moves the ship in the wrong direction. See, compromise always lowers the original standard. We've seen churches move away from the Lord. We've seen churches lose their way being controlled by different thinking from Christian thinking the church must be subject to the word of God and to Christ Hebrews 10.23 teaches this, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And in Jude it says, Contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. See, compromise is never offensive. It seems good. These areas are gray. Let us let other people have a, a different point of view. John 15 verse 19 should clear up the matter. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. And compromise is sometimes, oftentimes, the first step to total disobedience. King David, his sins of adultery and murder didn't happen just because there was a weak moment. It 
and the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Ramah, but David remained in Jerusalem. See, that was the setup. He didn't do what he normally do. It was a compromise that set him up for destruction. Peter rebuked the Bal Balaamites in 2 Peter 2, 15 and 16. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he received a rebuke from his own transgression. For a mute donkey, speaking with the voice of a man, restrained the madness of the prophet. In 2 Corinthians six fourteen to 17 the apostle Paul points out the sinful absurdity of believers seeking to unite with the world. Do not be bound together with unbelievers, for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Baal? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and they, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. See, we need to remain faithful and loyal to Christ. And he promises to give some of the hidden manna, this honey-flavored bread with which God fed the Israelites during their years in the wilderness. This hidden manna represents Christ himself, the bread of life who came down from heaven. All the hidden blessings and benefits of knowing Christ. We have to make a choice to be faithful believers. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. No amount of satanic opposition can destroy genuine saving faith such as those believers had. He rebuked the church, Christ did, for their toleration and compromise. There can be no compromise between loyalty to Christ and sinful pleasures of idol worship or sexual immorality. Christians may differ in some areas, but there is no room for heresy or moral impurity. Don't tolerate sin by bowing to the pressure to be open-minded. On moral issues, they want us to be open-minded. But we cannot be open-minded with the Ten Commandments. We must remain faithful so that we will be rewarded by Christ with his presence, with the bread of heaven, and with his acceptance of us into his kingdom. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we recommit ourselves to following the truth, to putting our trust in you, not in acceptance by those in our world. Sure, we want their respect, but Lord, we value you following you above it all. We seek 
to follow you with our whole heart, with no compromise. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.